everybody. Welcome again to another weekly Baseball Brew Crew podcast. We're keeping baseball history alive, one craft beer at a time. Wherever you are watching us or listening to us, please give us a like and a follow. And if you love beer with your baseball, please tell a friend. Here is the lineup card for today. Let's do it. In the leadoff spot is our VP of content development at the Baseball Brew Crew. It is Angelo Trinidad. Welcome. How you doing, man? Good evening, gentlemen, and good evening, everyone viewing here tonight. Uh, I am in the process of developing some more fun content for this channel, uh, for the Baseball Brew Crew, and I'm excited to uh, bring some of that stuff uh, to you guys. So I'm working in the lab, grinding it out, getting these videos filmed. Um, but uh, yeah, excited to be here uh, with uh, two of my favorite pals. Right on, right on. Glad to have you. Good to see you as well. Next, he's the field correspondent and senior research analyst here at the Baseball Brew Crew. It is Kevin Lyon on time. Even though it's a recording, you're always on time. Hey, I'm already, at least I'm on time finally at last. It only took a couple years and that's going, you know. Okay, fizzle, Brazil. Okay. <laughs> hey, we go live occasionally and I was live the last, I was alive i've been alive before all you guys were alive <laughs> anybody listening to this heck we didn't have radio when i was a, you know, no we, we didn't had to, we had to we had to get a little megaphone go hey the cubs won today <laughs> <laughs> you know. anyways well, i got you that voice sounded familiar yeah see there you go you know it's just like when rocky would call adrian you know you know he'd be calling out that you'd be yelling out the window to call her because he never phone. <laughs> again phones did not exist either it, you know, when I was growing up. That's right. Uh, I think I even made a, a reference uh, uh, to a mimeograph uh, no, earlier. Just, that was even invented. I was saying, now you're almost talking my language. You know what I mean? I, you know, geez. I had <laughs> no. pigeons, all right? I had pigeons. <laughs> that, that was literally social media back then. Yes. It, oh, yes it, <laughs> yeah. You know, took, you know, I may never have heard back any from any of my pigeons, unfortunately, <laughs> but I'm here today. I got a challenge. I got a, a pretty interesting beer and i got some old school cards for pint and packs love it love it our goodwill ambassador and sultan of swig at the baseball crew cowboy jack durango he is actually in utah right now and uh i'll i'll make mention that of that a little bit later um hopefully he'll be able to jump in at some point uh if not um have a safe trip up there, Cowboy Jack, and uh, get back safely. I, I know that, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to save my comments <laughs> till later for, for Utah, uh, but I, I, I definitely have some uh, thoughts about that. There's some interesting stuff around that. My name is Michael Mondragon. I'll be your humble host for the festivities tonight. Let's get to it. As tradition on the show, we always bring a new and unique craft beer to review and enjoy. So let's see what we are drinking tonight. I'm going to start off with Angela Trinidad. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. So this upcoming weekend is Royal Rumble weekend. So I wanted to do something wrestling themed. Um, but before I talk about um, what you see on the screen, I wanted to talk about the brewery. So Siren Craft Brew um, and Kevin just returned to, from a trip from England. Uh, they're based in Walkingham, Berkshire, England. Siren Craft Brew was founded in 2014 by Darren Anley, and they'll be celebrating their ninth anniversary this upcoming March. So um, this uh, the beer I want to talk about is the Royal Crumble um, Sour Beer. So uh, they've given some subtle nods, the brewery has, to uh, wrestling references, as they also have a Big Red Machine Red IPA in homage to Kane. Uh, but this Royal Crumble Sour Fruited Beer is recreating the classic crumble in all its sweet and sour wonder. Sharp, tangy rhubarb joins forces with a kettle sour base to bring vibrant, mouth-puckering tartness. Our crumble topping combines biscuity, nutty, mixed grain malts with delicate spices, while lactose brings everything together with a silky, smooth body and comforting sweetness. So shout out to Siren Craft Brew for uh, helping me um, get, uh, you know, prepared for the Royal Rumble. Right on. How did, how did you find out about this one? Um, I was reading a blog of the top 20 wrestling themed beers. So, and I was like, let me do, let me do something wrestling themed. And uh, this worked out perfectly. 
because it had you know the intent of what why I wanted to uh, talk about a wrestling theme beer. And there's actually there's actually not only is I mean I was surprised to see there's top twenty, but there's way more than that too, which is super cool. So there's a there's a lot to talk about, and maybe uh, I can talk about some more of those um, coming up here soon. Yeah, I saw that they actually had a collaboration with Stone Brewing. Um, yes. Which- so um, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure how that came about. I'm obviously too, you know, a powerhouse here in, in California, but uh, always cool to see um, partnerships and uh, collaborations across the pond. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Kevin, definitely. did you have any Siren Craft Brew when you were out in England? No, I, 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 I that, that town sounds not familiar in the least. So I will, I wouldn't even know where to find this, you know. Because once you went to like certain pubs, there'd be only like it'd be like a lot of the same breweries at, at all the pubs. Yeah, there's a craft beer. There'd be like four or five different breweries that would have spots. You know, if you want to send more variety, you'd have to go to like a, a Tesco. That's where I saw a lot of like, <laughs> variety of beer. I think Michael would know what a Tesco is. Yes, yeah, like a local. That's more or less. Yes, yeah, that's the big. That's the big supermarket over there. And <laughs> owners of Arrested Power to Fresh and Easy. I love Fresh and Easy when they were around. <laughs> oh, is that right? I didn't yeah, know Tesco that. Tesco was behind, was the owners of Fresh and Easy. No kidding. I, I, I do miss Fresh and Easy. Oh, okay. All right, that makes sense. Uh, no, very cool one. I, I'm glad uh, you brought this uh, to our attention. Thank you for that. It's really great. Of course. So Cowboy Jack uh, is in beautiful Utah right now. This is a picture of the picturesque. Uh, scenery there um, and uh, he's really enjoying it and uh, of course he's not too far from from a pub uh, which I, in Utah I'm sure I, I, I don't even know I've never been to Utah pub. But, what, pub. was it a pub or was it just a restaurant oh I don't know but come on pub okay so, yeah, so not, I'm sorry to say it but Utah's not known for their drinking scene okay so that that's why I was gonna say I, I'm really unfamiliar uh, with it I think I've only been there once we went through there and and I think I went to like a like a red Robin or something like that they, and they had craft beer but I was like oh, it was okay. um, yeah it was it was it was okay but but this is one that he actually found and I actually looked it up <laughs> this is actually a thing I thought this was a joke and uh, I actually looked it up so this is the polygamy Porter. Uh, by Wasatch Brewery in Sake, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. The, the, the description of this is outstanding. And here I go. Why have just one? Polygamy Porter is a smooth, chocolatey, easy drinking brown porter that's more than a little naughty. Take some home to the wives. <laughs> Can you have the Jackie laugh? Jackie laugh, please. Hey, that's <laughs> funny. <laughs> I gotta get up. Oh my god, I don't have what is my Jackie laughter? There we go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Like I can't even believe this exists. I I thought I seriously thought this was a joke. Like I, <laughs> I, I like that there's like like alcohol, like sushi, slush, sushi, slushies in the background. He's actually yes. found a bar. Cause I, I don't know if it was true, but I remember it'd be like, uh, I remember here at one point you had to like get a certain like membership card to even go into like the breweries that existed in Utah. So I'm guessing that might have opened yeah. up more over the last like decade or so. But I've only, I only know if I've ever, I've been to Salt Lake. I don't think I've been to Salt Lake. I've been to parts, yeah. I've driven through Utah, but I've never really like stopped by anywhere. Yeah, and it's strictly rumor, but uh, I mean, I was also under the impression like you could only buy like beer during certain times of the day. You couldn't buy it on, the, you know, certain times in the weekend. I was like, I've heard all the rumors, but I didn't know what was true and what wasn't. So it's like, um, it's like those dry counties in certain places. Right. Outside of California, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So at least they have a sense of humor. So it's like yeah. that, that, was, that was refreshing to see. I, I doubt that the head brewer is Mormon. I'll just leave it at that. Right, right. That's that's a given. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm really going on a limb there. So, Kevin, tell us about your beer. Oh, goodness. So, um, I went to Stero Brewing Company. They're based out of Placentia, California, uh, a little, you know, the kind of like northeast part of Orange County. And I know I had a beer there before called, uh, do I do I say it like the song? The Basa! There you <laughs> go. There you go. Pixies. So, their thing is they like to do music-themed names with their breweries and their different styles and things like that. And so 
the this past Saturday was their sixth anniversary party. So I was like, well, let's go check out what they have. I had a couple of beers, met up with a uh friend of someone, a person who's become a friend who's a fan of ours from the blog, knew me from the wrestling days, you know, and I'm just checking everything out. And this is their special they made for the for the occasion. I have not opened this up yet. You'll see why in a moment. Um, and just to give you an idea of how, range, how wide the range is, Michael, they ha- uh, I had a beer called Perfect Day, which was named for a Lou Reed song. Uh, they yeah. have... They had, they've had in the past a beer called Blonde on Blonde for Dylan. Okay. I think there's more modern. <clears throat> I, it's not. It, I only heard much modern music before, but it's like, um, what's the other one I had? I had a beer called Forever Changes for uh, an album by a band called Love that would have came out in the late 60s. I'm like, all right, I'm now with all this stuff. Because okay. yeah. so, I'm old. I was only 125 when these musicals coming out in the 60s, you know? So <laughs> I was in my prime. <laughs> but more or less, this the, the guy behind this company is named uh, Rick. He... Uh, he was a brewer, at, I think, at Left Coast and Firestone, and yet find his own place. And I think, and it, it, when asked why open a brewery, he simply says, "Because I can't do anything else." Oh, there you go. Before he went to brewing, he apparently was a deadhead. He would he would go to deadheads, Great Will Dead shows, and follow him around. That you know, back when that was a thing before okay. Jerry Garcia passed away. Um, but I'm just going on that tangent there. But hey, you know, I've enjoyed everything I've had there. So here we go. This is their year six Imperial Stout. We want to release something big to celebrate six years of stereo of a fresh Imperial Stout. We use 12 different roasted malts for added complexity and character. The result is a midnight black beer with flavors of both milk and dark chocolate, toffee, and a slight warming heat at the end. So here's where the joke comes in. I buy one. I'm like, okay, cool. I buy one. And all of a sudden I look. And it says, what version do you have? And I'm like, what? And I have this one. I don't know if you can tell. It's a silver one. It says, silver lid, our fresh stout, unadulterated, just malt, water, hops, and yeast. I'm like, okay, what's the gold one? We took up a notch with toasted coconut and marshmallow for a confectionery spin. Oh. So I got that one too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Heck yeah. So <clears throat> am I really going to drink 32 ounces of a 13.5% stout <laughs> on this show tonight? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, what should I open up first? The regular oh. one or should I go for the, 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 the taking go. it up a notch? Go for the gold one. Go for you the gold. Go, you want to go for the gold first? <laughs> go for the gold. <laughs> well, you're only going to get through one, Kev. So how dare that's you? true. That, that might be He's true. He's pushing me right here. He's pushing me to just go for them both here. Because <laughs> I kind of want to try this one first because just to see what the actual original yeah, flavor is. But, yeah. but you know what? Who knows if I'm gonna get through one? So let's just get this one out of the way. <laughs> you don't so, know uh, Kevin's iron constitution. He <laughs> he'll power <laughs> through. <laughs> And I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not a big coconut guy. That's the only reason I almost didn't do it. Yeah. But I was like, you know what? No, nah, you know what? You gotta do it for the show. I've definitely warmed up to coconut. I, I, I used to not like it too. It used to remind me of copper tone, uh, what, the copper tone, like suntan yeah, lo- yeah. lotion. Oh yeah. Uh, it, that's what it always reminded me of. Uh, I, now I love it. And, and this looks delicious if it has, um, yeah, it's like I said, it's toasted coconut and marshmallow. Uh, along with the other the flavors thing, I thing, all that. the thing looked like it was like castor oil coming out of the can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, and I'm like, Ooh, let's see how yeah. smooth this is. <laughs> And so, yeah, 13 and a half percent. Wow. Um, I'll try and see if there's a. Because oh, 13 wasn't strong enough, right? No, That's exactly. Right. 13.5. <laughs> I'll try. And yeah, it doesn't really give more information than that. I'll try to see if there's like an IBU. No IBU, but whatever. It's fine. You know, you're not going to care about IBU when you drink a 13 and a half percenter. Exactly. No, I don't expect it to be too hoppy. Yeah, this this is actually very good. It, I, I, sometimes I get a little overpowered by the sweetness of it, mm-hmm. you know. But um, man, it's oh, now, there's the coconut and there's the marshmallow. And, oh, that's it's this is really good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you for telling me to go for the gold, Angela. We'll see. I might be going for a silver medal. I can be going You're for a silver medal in about always. twenty minutes. Yeah, that's yeah. Awesome. Twist my arm to drink two stouts, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it looks so good, and and we haven't been to stereo in a long time. It's it's been a while. Um, yeah, because um, it said their sixth anniversary when they only opened in twenty sixteen. I felt like the, when you and I went, Michael was longer than that, but it must have been around like 2018, 2019. Yeah, I was gonna say it's like they they didn't seem very old back then. But six, no. wow, then yeah, they, no, that's they, six years. I'm like, what? 
Yeah, so that's awesome. Shout, I got to give a shout out to our, uh, a friend of the show of ours today, Robert. He's the one who uh, – I saw him at Radiant Friday night, and he told me <laughs> – I walked around the Radiant. He was just there, and he's like, hey, we're going to stereo tomorrow. Come meet up. I'm like, sure, why not? Yeah, that's cool. Cool. Partner in crime. Like I like it. Yep. Very cool. Um, so my beer is, um, it, it, I'm sorry, Kevin, I'm going to have to say it was gifted to me by my other Kevin, uh, in Arizona. And, uh, he actually gave me six Arizona beers. Nice. Um, and this was one of them. I was really surprised about this one because I, I, upon first glance, I'm just like, uh, I don't know if you can see it in this picture and not an, uh, but it's it's actually from a place, and I had I have to stop because it's called the Shop Beer Company. Yes, it doesn't seem because I was thinking it's the Beer Shop Company, but it's actually um, the Shop Beer Company. Beer company. Probably because there already could be a, a place called the Beer Shop Company. Exactly, it and seems like pretty. And we uh, went to a place by us in Anaheim called the Beer Co. I don't know if right. it's a beer company or right, beer company, right, right, right. You know. So this is the Church Music IPA. It is 6.7 ABV, 46 IBU. Now, the description of this is kind of interesting because it really doesn't describe it, but I'm going to read it anyway. And I'm going to read it in, in the voice that I think that it's supposed to be. Uh -oh. Are you ready? Yes, sir. You can hear that because the door was wide open. We told them to leave it that way. Sorry if it just sounds like noise. If you could actually hear it, you'd probably like it. You'd probably get into it. There's something about it that most folks seem to like if they're honest. But if you can hear it clearly at first, if you simply hear noise and clamor, you're probably going to stay away. Don't. If you got the ears to hear, then come on. You're welcome. All are welcome. See, isn't that a sweet sound? It's church music. May your cup overflow with it, brothers and sisters. <laughs> that is the description of this beer. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Which I laughed because I thought it said church mouse. Like, oh no, church music. I was like, wait, what? Church is music. music. Nice. <laughs> So I, you know I'll, what, Michael? I feel yeah. like I'm gonna be able to see the light after you know, <laughs> I had that beer. Do I mean, you I'm gonna see, see the light. light. I'm gonna see the light anyway. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we always used to say to each other. When we go on Space Mountain when you first go up and you're going up the incline. You see this yeah. light coming at you. We're like, "Do you see the light, brother?" <laughs> it reminds me of uh, uh, Blues Brothers when uh, oh, James yeah. Brown is the oh, yeah. preacher in the church. Do you see the light? That's exactly what I mean. Yes, yeah, sir. Getting the band back together. Oh, no, are we? Oh, no. You don't want my band to get back together. <laughs> yeah. My so this is ruffians. Yeah. So this is good stuff. So it's a juicy IPA. Um, uh, definitely an Arizona juicy IPA. I, again, I, I, I have that taste of it. I can just tell it's from Arizona and I don't know what it is. A super tangible thing. I think it's just being, um, Again, being so blessed and and uh, and spoiled by the West Coast IPAs, um, I can definitely taste the Arizona influence on this one, and um, yeah, it's just it. But it's a good. It's it, and I'm not trying to discount it in any way. Um, but yeah, the the Arizona influence is definitely here. So um, I want to say it's almost like a uh, more of a German influence in the Arizona beers. I think I said that uh, so about some of Jack's beers. Um, but I think that they they have some of that more. Um, I, I don't even know how to explain it uh, to make it to make it clear here. But um, yeah, it's just more of a German influence um, in some of the beers there. Whereas here is there's there's definitely more of an IPA type of fruity flavor. And and now it's like those those even those porters. I mean, those are uh, definitely. Uh, different now so we're we're getting a, a a big mix i actually you know the one the next place i would love to get beers from that we haven't got a lot from is is like the san francisco bay area uh -huh. yeah i've it's been so long since i've had anything from up there i was really liking that uh pre-pandemic i and uh yeah there's not that many breweries you can find uh like casually down well i mean i mean there's like bigger ones like the anchor steam anchor and uh right. 
Oh gosh, what's the number for the amendment? I can't. You think I would know? Oh, twenty first amendment. I I, I I helped write that amendment. Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I right that. <laughs> yes, of course I was. You think I wanted prohibition? Sure, I would make it a killing on the side, but you know. <laughs> Uh, hilarious. So some good beers tonight. Um, yeah, thank you for those. All right. So let's do it. This is this day in baseball history for January 24th. Yes. Baseball history in January. Uh, in fact, uh, just today there was baseball history and we'll talk about that later. Uh, Kevin, I want you to bring that up. Right. So January 24th, 1931, after being released by the Indians four days ago, Alabama native Joe Sewell, who will spend the first 11 years of his career with Cleveland, signs as a free agent with the Yankees for $10,000. The 33-year-old future Hall of Fame infielder will... Uh, the record holder for the most consecutive games without recording a strikeout with 115 will hit 282 during his three seasons with the New York Yankees. That is amazing. Uh, didn't strike out in 115 games. That sounds really? like Tony Gwynn level kind of stuff. You hear all right. those Tony Gwynn crazy stats. I was like, wait a minute, what's Tony Gwynn's biggest number? I'm like, I have to like, you know, you figure he's the, you figure he wants a whole season about striking out the way they make him sound nowadays. Right. Right. I and wonder I, how many walks he had during those. That's a yeah. good question. That's a really good question. Um, yeah. I, I don't remember there being, uh, at least back then, a lot of like intentional base on balls. Right. Um, so yeah, so yeah, they probably went right at him, at him all the time. So that, that would be interesting mm -hmm. to look up. Man, um, and, he, and he looks like a spring chicken in that photo compared to the, yep. re, compared to the, <clears throat> the plaque there. He's looking yeah. old and he's looking like very rugged. Yeah, for sure. I remember there was, remember there was that crazy stat of like Joey Votto where he, he never popped up in the infield until like, right. you know, like some crazy amount of years into his career. <laughs> I love stuff like that. Love stuff like that. Um, I think there's in, in the NFL, I think there's a, there's something that's never happened in the NFL. I don't, and I, I, I hope I'm, um, I'm hope I'm even close on this one. I think it's like someone blocking a point after attempt and then returning it for a touchdown. Um, it's, I don't think it's ever happened in the NFL. There's something crazy like that. I'm, I, I hope, I hope that's even close to it, but there, there's something I've always wanted to just, every time I watch an NFL game, I always like, Oh, this could happen. You know, it's like, and I would think it's more possible now because the extra point is so much further back, you know? Right. I mean? Right. I'm sure on like two point conversions, it's probably happened because you know, that's, it's an offensive play as opposed to just kicking the ball and just trying to right. block it with but, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's I, I think it's never happened in, in NFL history. So um, I'm like, is this the time that's going to happen? But uh, yeah. All right. So January 24th, 1939, needing an additional player to reach the initial goal of having at least 10 inductees before the dedication ceremonies this summer, members of the Baseball's Writers Association of America elect we Willie Keeler, George Sisler, and Eddie Collins to be in the inaugural class of the Hall of Fame. Now, when I first read this, this was kind of interesting because I'm like, this is a little misleading what the way they kind of write this. Yeah. Yeah. So it says the three players are chosen, uh, are joining the 1936 selection of Ty Cobb, Babe Ruth, Hannes Wagner. Christy Mathewson and Walter Johnson, along with Nat LaJoy, uh, Tris Speaker, <clears throat> Cy Young, uh, selected by the writers a year later. Right. But. Yeah, uh, they're saying 10? Yeah, because yeah, there it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so this picture is all of the Hall of Fame's living members, except for oh, Ty okay. Cobb. Okay. Um, this is on June 12th, 1939 in Cooperstown. But this so is the, the weird okay. this is the weird wow. thing. So 36, mm -hmm. Ty Cobb, Walter Johnson, Christy yeah. Matthewson, Babe yeah. Ruth, Hannes Wagner. Mm -hmm. So that's five. But in 37, um Nap LaJoy, Connie Mack, who's in yeah, the I, I see Connie Mack there. Yeah, I definitely yeah. recognize Connie Mack. John McGraw, Tris Speaker, uh George Wright, and Cy Young. So that's, that's 37. 11. 
Yeah. Right. So in 38, because I, I was like, did they skip two years or what, what was the oh. deal? So like in 38 was Grover, Cleveland, Alexander. Oh. Um, and then uh, uh, Alexander Joy Cartwright, which I'm not familiar with. Uh, he was, I think, one of the guys who helped. Uh, he was like a manager or like he was something involved, I think, off the field of baseball, if I remember right. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So behind the scenes kind of stuff. And then Henry Chadwick. So there's three right there. But then 39. So get this. So it says like, it, it, you know, they Those needed three extra three players. But so <clears throat> in 39 was Cap Anson, Eddie Collins, Charles Comiskey, Candy Cummings, Buck Ewing, Lou Gehrig, Willie Keeler, Hoss, uh, Old Hoss Radborn, yeah, George Sisler, and Albert Goodwill Spaulding. So, <laughs> I, so this whole thing was like I, I was like, w- w- they needed ten, like so maybe maybe this was all before any yeah. or separated. What I'm it. guessing is the building may not have been ready yet in '36. <laughs> that that's what it was. So in '39, it finally opened. Right, but right. I didn't know. But the way they made it sound like nothing happened in thirty-seven and thirty-eight. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Weird. so, but this is a. This, I mean, this is an awesome picture. Uh, yeah, great picture. when you're going through that list, I'm like, are they mean ten players? Because you did mention like Connie Mack. Well, Connie Mack played and man, so that doesn't even really even work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it's kind of misleading. Uh, so um, again, I just why we do the research and try to figure these. These things out, or and just I, figure I, out who, whatever whoever made that information, you know, available about this day in baseball history. Like, what the heck do they mean? By yes, that? we're oh, we're, we're fact checkers here. <laughs> love it, love it. Oh, and and then today, Kevin, baseball oh. history happened today for the Hall of Fame. Yeah, Fame. there we go. I mean, I I was surprised. I heard people talking about, it, but I didn't think he was gonna Hall of Fame. But there you go, Scott Rowland got voted in. So it's gonna be Scott Rowland and Fred McGriff going to the Hall yes. of Fame this year. Uh, Todd Helton just barely, just barely, barely missed, missed out. It. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, there's some other players. <laughs> if you look at their stats, are a little better. Just a little better. I'll yeah. just leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> I still don't. Never, I, go ahead. And they may never get, they, they're not, the only way they'll get in is like some of those other guys are going to be by the players for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The writers are way too I, 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 picky. I, I don't know because. It's amazing how historically, like, no one has ever gotten in unanimously. There's people who say, I will not vote for someone on their first year, no matter what. Right. You know? Right. Like, really? Well, <laughs> really? That, that actually comes up oh. in this day in baseball history. Night, good foreshadowing. There you go. So, January 24th, uh, this is 1955. <laughs> this is a weird one, but a funny one. But uh, isn't that William Daniels on the left? <laughs> there's your there's your deep cut right there, Michael. Yeah, that, that is a huge. But no, that is Cubs business manager Jim Gallagher, who oh. is the chairman of a nine man rules committee. Um, he announces that the two leagues will implement an existing rule during spring training that requires a pitcher to throw a ball when the bases are empty within 20 seconds of taking a pitching position. Uh, the mandate, which results in umpire calling a ball when, um, when tosses are tardy, uh, will not be in, fe- in effect during the season. So, you can go back to 1955 <laughs> that these pitchers were on a clock. They wanted to speed up baseball. A yes. clock. Come on. Like the umpire is really counting. Come on. Jeez. You know, you know what they could have used? They could have used maybe like some kind of like, well, it wouldn't exist back then. I was maybe some kind of mechanical <laughs> thing, like a like what, like a kit or something like that that would have a voice that would sound like William Daniels. Uh, <laughs> I'm just doing William Daniels joke, sorry. <laughs> Just something mechanical, just like this. Announce the, you know, to announce. Keep track of the clock. I mean, do we have? I mean, how how big were electronic scoreboards even back then in the fifties? Probably not even really a thing, right? Well, if you remember, um, I want to say it was like even like in the Olympics, didn't they have like the the? It was like the 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 clock yeah, with the, the clock, clock. Yep. Yeah, yes. with the hands mm-hmm. and stuff like yeah, that. Hands, yeah. Yeah. yeah, So that could have happened. I, I, I think don't remember. Yeah, we had to be getting close to electronic clocks around this time period, though, for sure. Yeah, you're you're probably not already. Right. You figure yeah. I would know I was around for all this stuff. <laughs> so 
So January 24th, 1973, Warren Spahn becomes the only the sixth player elected to the Hall of Fame in his first year of eligibility, receiving 316 of the 380 uh, votes cast by the baseball writers. Uh, that's 83%. Um, right. The Buffalo, New York native who recorded 13 20 win seasons with the Braves retired as the winningest left handed left handed pitcher mm -hmm. in big league history with 363 victories. A remarkable feat given he recorded his first victory at age 26. Wow. That is nuts. Oh my gosh. He is. Wow. Yeah. He was 363 and 245. Can you imagine? That's that's, that's crazy. No, yeah. Can you imagine? He still only got like 83 percent of the vote. Yes. Yeah, but I, that, like he, I think he's fourth all time for wins. Well, yeah. Maybe the top ten pitcher of all time, and, and still four fifths, one fifth of the voters are like, no. Yes. 2,500 strikeouts. His his career ERA was 3.09. He was a 17-time All-Star, not good enough. World Series champion, Cy Young Award winner, not good enough. Eight times NL uh, wins leader, not good enough. <laughs> Can you imagine? How, how do you not say that? It's like three-time ERA leader, four-time National League strikeout leader, pitched two no-hitters. His Atlanta Braves 21 is retired. He's in the Braves Hall of Fame. He's uh, on, also on the... MLB all century team. Oh yeah, he absolutely should be. Yeah. And you know, it's funny now. So we said 30, 30, I don't know what year they started electing. Let's just say 36 and the writers started voting. We're almost 40 years in and how many players you say was first year of eligibility. He's the oh, what? The sixth or seventh? That's six. Ever six. Yeah. Six. Only six players. Yeah. In their first year. That tells you I'm, I'm, I'm not going to promote on these writers, but <laughs> I wish Cowboy Jack was here to cut the promo for me. But then yeah. it's, it's, you know what that is? It's hogwash. I'll tell you it's what it is. Right it's there. hogwash. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> I will agree with you. Yeah. Warren Spawn definitely did not celebrate it enough. And I, I love, I, you know what? I think it's also like he was right before TV, maybe that like people didn't, didn't I mean, see him on TV he, or but if you look, he, so if you go by that, he would have finished up his career in about 67. Uh, you know, 65. Usually, so oh, I thought it's, I thought you're on the ballot five years after you retire. That's why I was like wondering. If that's oh, interesting. Well, um, so he, he was on the Mets, on, Mets in 65 and Giants in 65. Okay. Yeah. Right. I think it's seven or eight years. Yeah. I, I, I Maybe they changed it later to five. I thought it's five mm -hmm. years retired now. I thought it was like, I, I thought at one point it might've been 10. I might be no, wrong. It's, not, it's not 10. I know it's not 10. I, yeah, I thought it was, it was five, but don't, don't quote me on that. Well, maybe, but, uh, maybe and again, and this card here, I think, I think that's 56. I think that yeah. card's a beautiful card though. Yeah. And, and he, and I actually did get to meet him at card shows a couple of times back in the eighties and such a, a great guy too. He was just very happy to just meet the fans, talk about them. And I'm like, that's where you gotta love those old Hall of Famers who just were like, "Hey, you know what? You know, talk yeah. to you as opposed to other more of current players back in those days." And be like, "Yes, Chargaff. yeah, exactly, right, yeah." I think I think the ten, um, you fall off and you go into that secondary category. I okay. think that's what I was thinking. Um, yeah, super super cool. Uh, Warren I'm Spawn. A, I'm giving. I'm taking a drink for Warren Spawn. Yeah, sure. we might have to add Absolutely. him to the. Uh, to the to our uh, diamond icons, I mean, he's definitely worthy of it. We have to do some more digging. It's on only it. Hall of Fame worth anything right now. <laughs> You're absolutely right on that one. Or, I mean, hey, if if, if Morgana uh, can't crack our our, our diamond icons, I, I mean, it's like it has to be the elite. <laughs> you got to be the elite out there. Uh, I can't believe Morgana might fall off the ballot. Uh, oh, come on now. I think she just has to be there as, as forever, forever. Yes. We're, we'll get her in even if it's 20 years from now. There we go. <laughs> so this is an interesting one. January 24th, 2001, 68 major league umpires participate in a preseason session believed to be a historical first to practice calling strikes as defined by the rule book. So guys, what, what is the strike? As defined by the rule book. 
I mean, it, because I, it, it might be the wrong angle, but you know, I think it's supposed to point to your to your right. <laughs> no, the actual strike zone. What what is the strike? Oh, the strike That's, zone. Oh, I'm oh, sorry, oh. I thought you said calling a strike. I was like, is it like with the umpire signals? No, not I the mean, signal, but the actual. What what is the strike. actual strike as defined by the rule book? Oh, okay. So a ball that would be in the oh god, the batting zone, which would be between the player's shoulders and knees, and over the plate. Is that? Close yeah, you, you're 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 very close, but it's it's actually I'm changed. Uh, Angela, what okay. is what is what is your definition of it? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I Kevin sounded pretty good. I believe him. <laughs> I, I didn't make that up. <laughs> so, so I'll finish this out, but I, I, I'm going to continue this conversation because it actually it got me thinking. And and when you see these diagrams, you'll you'll understand a little bit better. But uh, at this time, with the help of minor leaguers wearing tape. Nine inches above their belts, the oh. men in blue get a good look at pitches commonly called balls, but are strikes when proper enforcement of the zone is put into place this upcoming season. So, so let's let's look at this a little bit. So this is very interesting. So 1950, 63, 69, 88, and 96. Look at all those. Strike zones. Wow, that's just in the last uh, 70 years. Oh yeah. But I kept on seeing this thing. If you look on the under 1996, hollow beneath the kneecap. I kept on seeing that as a definition of. What does that mean? I have no idea. I've never heard of that until now. And it's actually I, pretty common. Okay. It's just, just that, I guess, that little divot at the bottom right before it goes to your shin bone. Yeah. Know, that's weird. Because How do every, you even like determine that? Oh I don't God. know, and it's it's so it's different on every person, which you'll see. And then remember, like the high strikes, like anything above the belt, like people groan about. But actually, in this case, I've always heard, um, you know, when I started playing, it was exactly what it is in '69, which was the armpit was actually below the ar uh, armpit. And, and if you and you got to think about this too. So, you know, '63 was the shoulders to the knees, and. I'm sure, and this was obviously intentional for 69, because you remember too, Michael, 1968 was considered the year of the pitcher. That's right. You had Danny McClain get 30 wins. Bob Gibson had like, he won like 20, over 20 games. His ERA was like under two. So right. that's the year they lowered the um, the pitching mound too. Am I correct? Right. right. They lowered the pitching mound. And, they, and I didn't even realize they made the shame until I saw the year. But then they lowered, they shrunk the strike zone to make it maybe more beneficial for the batter. That's you right. Know? That's and right. Because I think they're trying to get more offense in baseball. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when when this is what I think the strike zone is, and, and this was actually, I think this one was from like the 94. Like this graphic was from like 94. And I'm like, this is what basically uh -huh. what the strike zone is, in my opinion. Uh, actually, it's probably now dropped a little bit lower because now pitchers are able to like – have ball come in at different angles. So I think it's dropped down. That, that's the ho hollow below the, the knees. Uh, but if you look at this, this is very interesting too. If you look at a guy named, like Altuve, and then you look at Aaron Judge, yeah. his his area is like bigger, but it's actually higher up. You know, so it's actually, the strike zone is actually higher. <laughs> and, and then I started thinking about this. I'm just like, how is anything called a ball or a strike these days? <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and again, it's just like how uh, the umpire has to, you know, how's the umpire calling that? You know, yeah. he has to like literally, was he have to look up the guy and just look at the stone and try to figure it out as the balls are coming in, you know? Yeah. That's what makes it interesting too, where now in the, I don't know when it originally started, but in the last few years, you see that grade, the umpires get graded, you know, on how they do. It's just like, oh my gosh. And uh, yeah, that's where you're like, oh my God, some of these guys are getting the high 90%. So I'm like, that's pretty impressive. Yes. You know? Yes. And you can see like the, the difficulty of this, it's, it's not like black or white on this one. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting to see like the kind of the evolution of it. And I was watching this one, uh, it was, I was on Twitter and there was a, an umpire, his name was Eric Gregg and Eric Gregg was, um, definitely, he was definitely one of those umpires that was shunned for his. Um, he he looked a lot like a rerun from uh, what's happening, and uh, he, and players how, called him as much. Hey, at, how about a baby for even more modern? How about how about I go a more modern sitcom? How about um, oh shoot, is it 
the the dad from Family Matters, or yes, maybe yes. or maybe Rock, who was also the guy who helped uh, wow. Bruce Willis in Die Hard. Yeah, you know, I think it's just like you know, this a larger guy, and just yeah. like you know, I, I think it, it's yeah. But the strikes he was calling was like they were ridiculous. Yes, they were they were not even in the zone. And uh, but it was again, it was a different time and, and uh, different camera angles too. But yeah. but still, it, they were definitely outside. Yeah, of the that guy time. was definitely. Uh, what's the umpire? Of, oh, he's like he's like the Angel Hernandez of the nineties. Yes, he, <laughs> yeah, he was definitely the Angel Hernandez of his day. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I thought this was uh, super interesting. To uh, we should definitely deep dive on this a little bit more um because uh, you can see here it's, it's obviously the the playing fields are are different for every batter and actually i remember there was actually a thing with ricky henderson uh right. oh no someone talking about ricky henderson you know he crouched down so much so where is his strike zone right. if he could stand up it would change and if he would crouch down it'd be different pete rose same thing right. yeah so yeah there's it's actually it's, it's kind of Umpires don't get uh their their um don't get their due here the actually of what they do call a strike. So um I think everybody wants it to be consistent and it's obviously every player is different. So uh very interesting. It, it definitely Crazy. a discussion we should definitely continue. <clears throat> All right, Kevin, you are up. Uh -oh. I'm, I'm up. I'm up. Should I just empty this in here? Oh gosh, see, I've not drank much of this yet. Oh look at there's the castor oil right there. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yes. So this is a we've done this segment before um, yes, with Python Pack. So explain to the people what Python Packs is. It it's very it's very difficult to understand if you've had a thirteen point five percent stout. But for the rest of you, it's simple. It's just I open up a, a pint of beer, which I did because this is technically a pint, and usually it's packed, but. This is like three packs in one right here. Look at this thing. See, we got this. Eyes open on a pack, and we just take a look at the pictures and just talk about, you know, the picture himself, the player, the background, jerseys, just anything that gets our eye. And sometimes there's some fun stuff on the back of the cards, too. Just to reminisce about, you know, for people who, like, find, like, 80s baseball and 80s baseball cards still fascinating. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. So – so for this time round, uh, you know, I guess nowadays this would be called a hanger pack, right? Right, Angelo? Yep, it would. So what I like here is on, on the back here it says each tops rack pack, but that's spelled R-A-K-P-A-K. Oh. Ooh, tops, look at you making – you're so fancy. Oh, edgy, Good. edgy. Yeah, they're so on edge. Um, and they're talking about this uh, rack pack. There's an insert in here. Oh, my Ooh. goodness. Ooh. Ooh. So I like this here. So it's 48 it, baseball picture cards, 48 plus one special. Ooh. But what's funny is you can see the special card right here on the front. I'm sorry. I got to make sure you don't see the glare here. <laughs> special card. Special card. So this is 1986 tops. This is, gosh, can you just hear this? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Um, so this is going to be 1986 tops. It was pretty much right as the baseball card industry was really blowing up. It blew up in the mid eighties for sure. And so um, this is actually going to have 48 cards plus the one special. What they would do is, and it's not, I think it's only on these and maybe on cello packs, you would get one of these cards as an all-star card. And in this case, there's 22 of them. So the idea is you get all of them somehow, but the ridiculous thing about these packs, you know, obviously you can see who the players are on the front and you see who the players are on the back. So, you know, people were for kids for sure were probably just going through all these looking for anybody they would know and recognize. It's got like my favorite thing I heard lately because it's just so ridiculous. Someone went to a Walmart with a mini scale and started mm -hmm. weighing packs of cards to determine if there was an insert in there, like a relic or an autograph. And I'm like, because they noticed the difference in the weight and the thickness. Like, like yeah. that is just so, man, <laughs> man. The carnies in the baseball card industry, come on. <laughs> and uh, another reason why we like opening cards in this era too is that, it, 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 like I said, besides like, oh, you know, the you know nostalgia and all that. So, but it's not like these cards are really worth anything anymore. Back in the day, it'd be like, oh my God, I got to get, I got to get a hundred of these Greg Jeffrey rookie cards of 88 clear <laughs> or 89, whatever. And you would buy, you know, a hundred of them for whatever. They get, all right, we're investing in our future. 
unfortunately, so many of these cards are made, they're not really worth very much anymore. You'd have to get a main star and get a PSA graded, which, like the example, you know, or uh, the one Angel gave me, the I had this one from George Brett 87. You know, it's not cheap to get these graded. You know, it depends on, I think it goes by the value of the card. Is that correct, Angelo? The sum is by the value on the card, also oh. depending on how quick of a turnaround you want. But yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> and and even and in this set, there's not really any real rookies to look for. I'll mention that while I'm looking this up. The biggest rookie in this is actually Cecil Fielder. And mind you, there's like almost 800 cards in this set. You know, that's kind of the crazy part too. So you have three little things here. So I'm just going with this one first. I'll save my all-star one for last. And um, the other guy we mentioned, the, like the most valuable cards would be in what's called the Topps Traded Set. So, mm -hmm. you know, nowadays you can get the, uh, it'd be the Topps Update Similar Set. Similar update. Mm -hmm. Yes. Except for the for the uh, the Topps Traded Series, it'd be the end of the season, but you could only buy the actual collect set as a whole. You can't, if right. you wouldn't get them in backs, so you have to do that. And the other thing that would be valuable, and Michael, I'm going to test your memory on this. Do you remember the Tiffany cards? I was just going to ask you about that if you were going to make mention of that. Those yeah. are, those are the, became the real super valuable ones. Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, these aren't worth much, but Tiffany was like the the high end version of the regular top set. It's a less quantity printed, and it was on like it, the pictures were nice. It was on a, ve a very a, a very high quality uh, card. I think card print. It was way mm -hmm. better than yeah. card. All right, so let's see what we got here. Oh my goodness, already cards are off this, or upside down here. So let's start off with an angel. I definitely remember. Not many people are though. This is Daryl Sconyers. Yes, this guy was stuck behind um, Rod Carew. Uh, you know, he's like the angel from eight, starting eighty one. So he's stuck behind Rod Carew at first base, and then you're like, all right, Rod Carew's retiring. I'm set, right? Nope, eighty six. Here comes Wally Joyner. That's took right. Baseball world by storm there. Wally world and. Um, Unfortunately, I, I, it just lists his first major league grand slam on the back of the card here. It's just so you guys, the back in case you've never seen these. I probably will read these talking baseballs. You know, let me just see what we got here. In this case, it has to do with the Angels here. Uh, the first player in Angels history to deliver three pinch home runs in one season was Joe Adcock during 1966 campaign. So you can oh, see they're God. not going to be that exciting of, of talking baseballs. <laughs> Sounds like something Michael and I would talk about, but not the yes. general public. Yes. I love the 86 design, by the way, too. Yeah. I think Which is super funny because I don't I don't remember loving it so much when I was a kid, and I don't think a lot of other people did either. Um <laughs> here we go. You want to see a picture of the 1980s? Look at this guy right here. This is Ron Washington. Be sure oh. to admire just the hair. Look at that hair and the cap up and oh, that dang. twins warm-up jersey. Future, future Rangers uh manager. Yep. Yeah, he definitely uh, uh no fun back in the back here, but uh we have our talking baseball. The first player in Twins history to belt two home runs on opening day was Gary Gaetti. Gets the Seattle Mariners in April 6, 82. I don't know if I'm going to read all these or not. I'm hoping I get better ones than this. A guy I'd never heard of, but he looks happy to make a top baseball card. This is Ed Jurak. I've never heard of him. Yeah. If I haven't heard of him, yeah. that means something, right? Yeah. And he's a shortstop slash third baseman. So I'm trying to remember human. I think Carney Lansford was on the Red Sox as third. I don't remember their shortstop. Oh, I'm sorry, Wade Boggs, duh. And I don't, mm -hmm. I don't remember who their shortstop was. But yeah, he's not getting much playing time here. Here we go. We can actually read this one. The first pitcher in Red Sox history to achieve a steal of home plate was Red Sox player. It, yes, pitcher. Um, Boggs. No pitcher. The, first, the first pitcher in Red Sox history to achieve a steal of home plate. Oh, Babe Ruth. There you go. Boom. First, the St. Louis Browns, August 24th, 1918. There we go. I was there for that game. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's go to pitcher here, uh, Craig Lefferts. That's yeah. a pretty good pitcher with the, with the Padres. I want to say the Giants as well. Giants as well, yes. Yeah. The, what? Okay. I like The first pitcher in Padres history to earn two victories in a doubleheader was Bob Miller versus Astros, June 23rd, 1971. That's how deep they're going on these. Like, geez, that's a bit much. All right, we were talking about the Red Sox infield. Let's talk about one of the stars there infield. At, he ended up having a great year in 86, being in the World Series, and I, he was probably the star for the Red Sox in the playoffs, Marty Barrett. Yeah. I'm still hoping to find one fun thing here, but eh. – yeah, no, I'm done with these talking baseballs. I need something more exciting here. Um, I talked about this guy recently, unfortunately, because of his passing away. But this is the manager of 
the Kansas City Royals, Dick Hauser, who has uh, an award named after in college baseball for the best college baseball player of the year. So there we go. And on the back of these cards at this point was that team's checklist. I don't recall if there's a main checklist in this set. We'll find out as we go through here. All right. I got I I'm I don't need to see the rest of this man, what he looks like, but he looks like he is a cool dude. This is Nelson Simmons. Wow. I never heard of this man, but look at that guy. That guy just he's the coolest guy in D Town for sure. Hey, he, he if if he had one year, he got to keep that sweet satin jacket. Yeah, Heck man, yeah. He looks, he looks so <laughs> cool. He looks really cool. So he's a DH outfielder. And just list it is first and everything. I was hoping we get some more fun facts here. Wow, we're gonna have your towards the end of this guy's career. Uh just is this, this is Le Grand Orange. Yes. From the Mets, wow. Rusty Staub. Hey guys. Gosh, speaking of man, he looks the opposite of Nelson Simmons here. And just give you an idea of how long he played baseball. There it is right there. Look at all that. Jeez. Wow. My God. This might be the One last year of his life. career. <laughs> I don't remember him getting a World Series ring in 86 in the Mets, so he might have been done at that point. Yeah, I don't All think right. – yeah. A guy I don't remember as much on the Phillies, but definitely something else on the Pirates. If you get a chance, you should just see what this guy looked like when he would pitch. His form was insane. Yeah. This is uh, Kent DeColve. Yes. Uh, he was a closer for the Pirates when they won the World Series in the late 70s. He was one of the best uh, firemen in baseball for sure for a while. Yep. You know, he had like – 30 like a couple of seasons like two seasons over 30 saves and uh like when he would pitch his elbow was looking like it would literally be a, like an inch inches off the ground you know it's yeah. just weird you had a really interesting wind up all right yep. going back to the mets it's time for an 80s mustache are you ready for an 80s mustache ready <laughs> here's a great one right here manager davy johnson wow there you go Yes. I don't know why his cap's so high. I feel like I feel like I need to wear my cap more. There we go. I'm, I'm not. Like All right. Oh, get your beers ready, ladies and gentlemen. We have second baseman Jim Gantner. Nice. And see, look at his cap too. His cap's up. Cheers, Jim Gantner. Oh my goodness, that's not enough. Get your beers ready again. Oh no, I was hoping I wouldn't get a lot of beers. Here we go. Isn't that look at his hat? Oh, nice. Ben <laughs> Ogilvy. Ben, ben Ogilvy, who I I and it's funny, I remember this off the top of my head. He won the he was a really good uh power hitter. He actually won the 82 American League bad uh home run crown. I think with 39. Oh, wow. Let me see if I, let me see if I'm actually right on that. Because God <laughs> brain man. Jeez. I'm sorry, 41 home runs. 41. Because I remember he beat Reggie Jackson. That's why I remember like Ben wow. Ogilvy won the home run title, not Reggie. Because that was Reggie's yeah. first year of the Angels, 82. And um, who beat the Brewers in the World Series that year, Michael Mondragon? That would be the St. Louis Cardinals. There you go. Actually, the, the Brewers should have be beat them that year, if in all honesty. But the Cardinals won in seven. So when I was hashtagging doing the research, uh, they would list like what is gone for a good amount of money if it gets graded as a mint 10 on the PSA scale. This is actually one of the ones. Eric Davis, not his first oh, wow. car. But Eric apparently, the Red. Like, yeah, if th if this is like consider a Jim Mint 10, it would be, it could be worth several hundred dollars. And I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. Oh, wow. Yeah. But this looks like it's a little off center at the top. I don't know if, I don't know is, if they're all yeah. like this or not. Yeah. yeah. But almost hard. all the cards yeah. they see here are kind of like that. So that might just be yeah. a thing. Yeah. But uh yeah, no, I'm a little disappointed by this. There's no real fun facts about these players. So I might be going a little quicker through these here. I think it's the Dodger Stadium. This is Giants uh, player Brad Wellman. Uh, really that's that's uh, Shea Stadium. Oh, three, okay, okay, you're right, tier. you're right. I was thinking that's right. I was thinking three cheers like Dodgers, but yeah, that's definitely yeah. Shea Stadium. See, that's part of the fun too is to try to figure out what is this. Yeah. Uh, here you go. I'll read this one because it's weird. The oldest manager in San Francisco Giants history was Tom Sheehan, 66 years, two months, 18 days old when appointed. <laughs> in, in June 18th, 1960. Wow. Too bad I was only about 100 and how old was I then? <laughs> I was 166 in 1960, yeah. I think. No, <laughs> that's not right. Whatever, it's fine. All right, we have a picture here named Ron Mathis. Right, you got to love just the different coloration of the of the yeah. seating. At the yeah. Okay. That's that's Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia. Oh yeah, you are correct. You are correct, sir. Do you know by that or by the banners uh, or by the circular? Uh, banners? Both, okay, both yeah. is confirmed. Yeah, that was definitely a thing back then. And to close it out, uh, 
Actually, this guy was a pretty good expo here. Do you remember Mitch oh, Webster, yeah. Michael? Mitch Webster, yes. Yeah, he had a few good years, I believe. He played at the Blue Jays at first, and then he, he peaked with the Expos. I want to see what the Phillies, but I don't remember for sure on that. Yeah. All right, geez, I better keep moving here. That's that's just the first third. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to put everybody – I'm going to be going night-night if I get more Brewers. All right, here's the guy. We talked about the Hall of Fame. This guy is definitely one that people want in the Hall of Fame. This is what they – this is the, the Braves leaders. This is Dale Murphy on here. And mm -hmm. on the back, it would just give the team leaders and stats. I'm sure Dale Murphy is on several of these. Let's see. Oh, oh no. Yeah. I just dropped the card. There goes that 10 cents. Jeez. <laughs> uh, runs, hits, doubles, home runs, RBIs, batting average. Jeez. The only departments he didn't win are was triples and stolen bases, which was by Claudio Washington, Michael. Oh, yes. Washington, yeah. I was going to guess Raphael Belliard. There you go. Uh, I, we have our third manager, and oh my goodness, <laughs> I have not thought about this man in a long time. Here's Pat oh, Corrales. Pat he Corrales. has his cap up high. Yeah, man. Former funny. Phillies manager. Also, I think he I managed on a lot, a lot of yeah. players. Everyone's wearing their uh, caps in '86, like my hairline would look like if I had hair. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Right. Uh, if I remember correctly, this is the '86 card. But I think this guy won. He went. Well, I mean, I think of somebody else. I was thinking he won a rookie of the year, but I, I might be right on that. I think he it's, might have in '85. No, because he had Vince Coleman, so there's no way he would have won '85. That I, terrible I, centering on the top part of the yeah. Card. yeah oh, I know. <clears throat> yeah, he got. Oh, that's part of the fun too, to see how poorly made these cards are. Jeez, yeah. Shawin Dunstan. How about that? Gosh, but he was actually Almost a pretty did. good player for a few years there. Yeah, for sure. Let's see. I have a Giants pitcher here named Mark Davis. I don't know. If this is the same Mark Davis who ended up being a pretty good closer later, I don't remember for I don't sure. I think that's it is, but um, yeah, I don't think it is. <laughs> See, and again, I get fun Giants facts like this. The first native San Franciscan ever to play for the San Francisco Giants was third baseman Alan Gallagher during 1970. So it took like 15 years of being in San Francisco for a guy from San Francisco to be on the Giants. All right. Mm. <laughs> Here's a here's a veteran here, although I can't tell old he is here because this picture's not the best. And you got his cat behind his face, Mike Morgan. I remember oh, okay. him being on the Dodgers. Yeah. Actually, a, he, okay, so he, this is weird. Look at this timeline here. 78, 79, A's, 82 Yankees, 83 Blue Jays, 85 Mariners. Jeez, but I remember him mostly as a Dodger. Yes. All right, we have our Red Sox leaders here. Michael Mondragon, who is that? Come on. That is uh, uh, Dwight Evans. Good job. Dwight Evans had led the team in uh, runs, hits, home runs, and, uh, yeah, that's it. Wow, Jim Rice not, is not anywhere on here at all. All right. Let's see here. Gosh, I'm going to get all my managers in here. There's a guy – I don't even remember this guy. Jim Fry? <laughs> Fry, yeah. Fry. Fry. <laughs> Let's go full Chicago here. Fry. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I, he doesn't like that joke. That, by the way, uh, Ferris Bueller, I think that was a movie in 1986. I've never seen it in the theater when it came out. <laughs> you probably did too. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm like, I would say, I don't know if it's my prerogative to get this card, but here it is. Well, Brown. I was trying to think of what song I wanted to use because like I couldn't think of one for every little step you make. So I was like, let me just go my prerogative. <laughs> it's my prerogative to get a Bobby Brown card and make that really bad joke from an 86 Padres guy. <laughs> I've never heard of this guy, but he was playing ball for – well, he actually had a year where he stole like 20 – he had two or three years where he stole over 25 bases. So yes. that he's, been, ball he's been on the mic for a long, long time and guaranteed to bust a stupid rhyme. There you go. Thank you very much. A guy here who I don't think busted many rhymes out there. This is uh, from the Expos, Randy St. Clair. I don't think wow. much coming from this guy. Yeah, no kidding. There's a vet. <laughs> there is a vet. And, and what's funny is like, see, on this one, they listed all his minor league years. I don't know if you can see no. here. He said he may have oh, basically gosh. debuted in 84, but look at all that time he spent in the minor leagues. Oh, my gosh. Yes. All right. Let's see here. <laughs> This is my, my favorite picture so far because it's just like, this is the best picture they get of Danny Walling. Like, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> they just jumped on the field, took the picture, and ran back in the stands. I mean, just in the dugout, I was like, 
Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, hey, I need Denny. <laughs> Man, I'm done. That's what they said. <laughs> Sorry, Denny. 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 Uh, let's see here. We have uh, a pitcher here named <laughs> – I love this picture too. It looks like he's like hiding something in his glove. Mark clear. <laughs> it's not clear what's in his glove. It's not clear why he's having that smirk. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> but just admire that card. Just admire it. And I'm not going to bother with that. Oh my goodness. Not only is it get your beers ready. We have a hall of famer. Get your beers ready. Why don't you guess who it is? Michael Mondragon. You'll probably be wrong. Oh, Oh, I, uh, oh, okay. 86. Yes. Um, I will. Oh, and I'll be wrong. I'll say. That's why you might get me saying that. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think of 86. Uh, I'm just going to go with Robin Yount. Ted Simmons. Ted Simmons. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to say still, he played on your team, but that would have gave it away. Still there. Wow. Yeah, he was at the Brewers. This is his sixth. He played for the Brewers for 81 through 85. But yeah. here's all on this guy's in baseball. Look at all that. Wow. Look at all yeah. that. Woo. Yeah. He's had a long career. I was like, oh, oh, yeah. Brewer. And thank you for taking your time. It made me drink more of my, my beer. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, Michael. I think I know what this is. So let's find out. Indians leaders. Are you ready? Name this ball player. Oh, is, is, that, is that Andre Thornton? I believe you're right. That's my guess too. Although Andre Thornton only led, he's yeah, it's got to be him because it's not it's not Julio. Yeah, it's definitely Andre Thornton. He had 22 home runs to lead the Indians in '85 with that. Oh God! No, he's 22. Uh, sorry, Angela. As 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 good as you are in current stuff, this is this is our wheelhouse right here. Oh, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Get your caps up higher because here comes Luis De Leon. Look at that cap. Oh wow! Oh my goodness! Wow. I don't think the hat could go any lower. <laughs> oh my it's God. Like, gosh! I can't go much higher. That's, I mean, I, I want at least yeah. keep my Leo Mudhens love a show. <laughs> <laughs> Luis De Leon. I'm really bummed I don't get any like fun facts of these players. That really started in the 87 set, I guess, then. Uh, we have a Yankee here. I believe he played also on the White Sox. Dan Pasqua. Oh, wow. You know Dan Pasqua, wow, that right? A deep cut, yeah. He's actually a pretty good player, though, for a couple of years, yeah. though, if I remember yeah. right, with the White Sox. All right, here we have a guy from your team. Why don't you tell me about Mike Jorgensen? Yes. Mike Jorgensen, a uh, former Met. I think he came over. I want to say, oh in, my gosh, him and him and Neil Allen came over like in a trade for. I, I, he might have come over in the the Keith Hernandez trade potentially. Okay, <laughs> look at the back of this card. Yeah, wow. he's a, he's had a very long career. <laughs> His rookie year in the major leagues was sixty. Gosh, I, I can't even read this. I think sixty eight with the Mets. This is nineteen eighty six. You've got the wow. Mets, the Expos, the A's, the Rangers, the Mets again, the Braves, and the Cardinals. Yeah, not bad. But, you know, I mean, not really a full time player. You only, you know, it looks like, but hey, you know, he made it. He yeah, made it. give him that. And to finish out the second third of our pack here, he's got a good grip on it. Ricky Adams, there you go from the Giants. Okay, yeah, there you, you go. Make that play, which again, that's I don't that, really know who he that, is. That's at Jack Murphy Stadium. That that picture. Oh. You can tell that just by the bar. Yes, on the, just, on by, the, just by the 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 railing on top. Are you sure it's not candlestick? Is, because is, that is, might be clear because I thought the fence was like kind of clear at candlestick. No, they're wearing grays, so it's yeah. Okay. Oh, they, yeah, they, yeah. They had like the chain link fence and there was a spot yeah. behind it. All right. All right. Let's see what we got here. Should I, should, I, should I show off my insert now? Let me show off my insert. Friend of the show, by the way, Ozzy Smith. There we oh, go. Oh, yeah. Hey. Good card right there. So there's 22. There's 22 of these, you know, so like I guess I know for sure they come in these rack packs. I kind of call them hanger packs. And uh, I believe, it, and and this is also, it's got a glossier, it's got a glossy finish on it too. But kind of similar to, I think, what the uh, Tiffany's were. I never really got the, any of the Tiffany's. All right. Here's a guy from our neck of the woods here in Orange County, California. Actually, a really good home run hitter, Tom Bernanski. Yes. Look at those yep. twin jerseys. Yes. I, that I doesn't look those. like a home run by that swing, though, to say the least. No, it looks no. like a like a fly out to shortstop. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but um, 
I mean, this at 84, 32 home runs. So that was his career peak at that point. Well, that's a lot for back in the 80s, for sure. Agreed. Agreed. All right, Michael Mondag. And here's a favorite of yours from the Cardinal era. How about this guy right here? Andy Van Slyke. Yes. Ooh. Yeah, he's still a Cardinal at that point. He was just yeah. ready to go to the Pirates. Yeah, because I, I, the first time I remember Andy Van Slyke was the 85 playoffs where he got walked. For some reason, to, to, for the for them to pitch to Jack Clark, I'm sure you remember That's that right. game very well. That's right. I remember watching That's that right. at my house and laughing hysterically. The Dodgers losing that game. Yep. So I'm going to move on here. All right, we got um, veteran. I oh, actually have not much of veteran here, but Dave Stapleton. Yes, definitely remember him. Not a starter, but he was with the Red Sox this whole time. Yeah, his whole career was with the Red Sox at this point. Yep. We, we all knew his mother, uh, Jean Stapleton. No, it was, it was not his mom. It, yes, Sorry. of course it was. Of all in the family. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and if you have to explain the joke, no, I'm just kidding. That's but really got a pretty good cut there too as well. All right, here. I think this guy, I believe, is a veteran. Oh, my God. I, I love this photo. I love this one. Jorge Orta. Yes. You know, because yes. it's like, it looks like the helmet is even up beside the cap. And just yep. a stash and just. The little compact swing, and he, he looks pretty happy to make whatever the ball went to. It looks like probably a single. But he was his rookie year was 72. How about that? Yep. He had uh, 1,500 hits in his career. That, that's and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, he was the player uh, during the Don Denkinger uh, play in 85 in the World Series. That, that controversial play. Gosh, I haven't thought about that play in a very long time. Yeah, I think, he was, I think right. that, he, was, he was the runner. Uh, again, we talk about the best pictures. I mean, this one, it's it just, I just the, uh, comment because it looks like Don Slots just saw a guy hit a home run. <laughs> That's definitely, he just gave yeah. the pitcher, just gave up a home run for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like the mask is even there. He's just standing there, just, but you know what? That looks like it's spring training, though. Doesn't I, it? it does. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, definitely like more, it's definitely different. It's not the regular jersey. It definitely is. Um, yeah. But he was a, he was a good veteran catcher, though. He played for a long time, Don Slot. Uh, oh, wow. I don't know if I've ever seen this guy. We're in 1986, right? Look who doesn't have a mustache in 1986, Michael Mondo. Wow. I don't know if I've ever right. seen him clean shaven. Oh, my gosh. No. That, that definitely, definitely another for, spring training, yeah. But definitely known for his mustache and on, on the field, being a manager later and all that. Um, I vaguely remember this guy. This is uh, for the Reds, John Stuper. You remember him at yep. all, Michael? Yep. Yep. He was, he was with the Cardinals. Oh, that's where I remember him from. All right. Yeah. Here is a guy who, this is a guy who could be considered, a, you know, potentially a hall of famer someday, but he had a hell of a career. Here's that on the Indians though. Oh, Joe Carter. Carter. Look at that hair yes. too. That's yeah. a young Joe Carter. Yes. Very young Joe Carter. Watch them all, Joe. You'll never hit one bigger. That's right. Uh, yeah, because this rookie, his first year in the major leagues, the 83 at the Cubs. I don't remember how he went for the – I forgot he came up with the Cubs. Mm -hmm. The Indians, and, of course, the uh, Blue Jays. Right. Oh, now, speaking of the Cubs and the Hall of Fame, it's Cooperstown. There's the quintessential Cub of this there era, Mr. Ryan Sandberg. That's it. Whoa. <laughs> and uh, he looked, was the, all these spring training photos, it's interesting. They have the whole season to do this, but they're getting all the photos in spring training. Like even that Denny Walling car of him in the dugout, that looks like a spring training dugout. It's kind of definitely, funny. Definitely. All right. <laughs> you know, I love uh, this. Here's the weird, the weird fun fact. Ryan's first tops card was 1983, number 83. Oh, I course. love they had to mention that. Yeah. Like that's the best fun fact I've had here. Like I said, I was kind of over these, uh, these, this, 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 this talking baseball thing. All right. From the White Sox here, we have another veteran, Scott Fletcher. I love those warm up jerseys. It's like this is batting practice, right? It's got to be. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. Oh, we have uh, – here we go. Now you want another good 80s mustache and a guy who definitely – don't be a clown in baseball and definitely a career after baseball as a coach, Rick yep. Dempsey. Yes, yes. You know, I think I have a pretty good swing there. Not known for his offense, but definitely a heck of a defensive catcher. All right. It looks like a, a not very happy Bill Doran. <laughs> you know, again, the best one you can get. These Astros guys, the Astros are not getting very good photos here with their players. <laughs> but again, cap, cap up. Yes, I yes. didn't know that was such a thing in the 80s, but there you go. But he is a pretty good infielder for the, for them as well. Another manager, Michael Mondragon. <laughs> and it looks like he could be your friendly grandpa, 
your Wilford Brimley. Here you go, Dick Williams. Yes, Dick Dude, Williams. I love hey. It. Yes. With an old man on the porch telling the kids to <laughs> get hey, out. Stop playing Peppa. Hurt <laughs> I don't know if this guy is still playing baseball, but hey, we have part of the big red machine right here, Michael Mondrag. We have Dave Concepcion. Yes, yes. He was he started with the Reds in 1970. Look at that. Reds just from the top to the bottom. Wow. Goodness. His first top scar was 1971, number 14 for you collectors out there. All right, I got a few cards left here. Let's finish this off here. We have – at first you'd be like, is the card for the guy sliding into him or is it for the sketcher, Glenn Brummer? Yes, Brummer? I remember Glenn Brummer. Yeah. No idea. It's Don Slot's <laughs> backup. Honestly. Yes. We have Don yeah. Slaughter. This is his backup. Yep. I love that picture. It's a great action photo there. I don't know who that is sliding into him. So Yankee number 20. I don't know how offhand that is. All right. We have shortstop and probably someone out here in WWF going from, uh, let's see, where's he from? From San Pedro de Macorís, Dominican Republic. In the corner of my left, weighing in 220 pounds, Manny Lee. <laughs> and he gets squashed by like Don yeah, Morocco or something like exactly, that. Exactly. Yeah. Magnificent Morocco, excuse me. And to finish it off, a, a hero. This is it. This is 1986 card. It'd be his year, 1986. I think he actually won the World Series MVP. Did he not? Or, or am I mixing it up here? Oh, I, I don't know if he he he, he, he was a hero the, for the '86 Mets. This yeah. is Ray Lopez. This is Ray Lopez. <laughs> I'm, not I'm Ray gonna go with the Jim Rome joke here. <laughs> <laughs> so Ray Knight was a great was a great player. Yeah. He's also known for being married season. to Nancy Lopez, who was considered maybe the greatest female golfer of all time. Yeah. And wow. so, my gosh, that was a lot of cards. I'm sorry that seemed to take all night. But look at this. I saw I saw my first one. Rats. I feel like I should chug this. No. That <laughs> but that Pike and Pax, thanks for hanging out, looking at some old eight, six cards, reminiscing, just having a good chat. Cheers, everyone. All right. So we're actually going to rename this segment. It's, um, it's not going to be a rest in peace anymore. Um, it's not going to be in memoriam. It's actually going to be a rest in power. Uh, segment where we actually celebrate some of the fallen baseball players. Uh, and we have two uh, tonight uh, and they, they should be remembered because they had a, a big part in baseball. Uh, and the first one is uh, not the big hurt, Frank Thomas. Um, Wait, not the is, big hurt, not the big hurt Alan Jefferson. Friend it of the is show. not. No, he is oh. still with us. This is uh, right. Frank Thomas. This is the outfielder, third baseman, uh, born in 1929 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, wow. and died in 2023 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Wow. Uh, as you see nice. here, he was a pirate. Um, his debut was 51 for the Pirates. His last game was in 66 for the Cubs. He had a uh, Lifetime batting average of 266. Uh, ironically, 286 home runs, 962 uh, runs batted in. He played with the Pirates, the Reds, the Cubs, the Braves, the Mets. So, and we'll definitely talk about that. Um, he played with the and in 65. He played for the Phillies. He, he played for the Astros. He played for the Braves, and then again the Cubs. Four teams in 19. Um, actually, it's 66. Uh, he played for the Cubs. But that's that's interesting because back in these days, players were not being shuffled around that much either. Right. And again, this is a guy who played. What, what year did you say he come up? 51. 51. Wow, that's a 15 year career. Wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. You don't get shipped around that much back in these days. Yeah, he sure. was a three time All Star in uh, 54, 55, and 58. Yes. Um, yeah, he and uh, he was actually um, known as the original Met. He was acquired uh, in the expansion draft uh, mm -hmm. by the Mets and hit 34 home runs and 94 RBIs for them in his first season. But you're jumping ahead. I want to talk a little bit about, about what I found out. Hashtag do the research. So when he was coming up with the Pirates, he was he was kind of known as being, I dare say, a rebel rouser. Ooh. ooh. <laughs> so he was a guy who tried to stand up for himself and, you know, when it came to making money. And apparently back in these days, that was not looked upon very well. So, and actually when he was coming up with the Pirates, um, let me see. Oh, it, so he actually went down to the minor leagues in 52 in New Orleans, believe it or not. 
And he got paid six grand when he was with New Orleans. And he requested an original, an additional thousand dollars when he re-signed with the Yank with the Pirates 53. So you might have heard of the guy who was running the Pirates this name. Uh what's his uh, uh Twig? Twig uh Twig Ricky, is that his name? <laughs> oh, Branch Ricky. I'm Branch sorry. Ricky. Branch Ricky. Ricky's response was said to be, quote, I can't pay major league salaries to minor league players. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. When he requested literally an extra thousand dollars over six thousand wow. to seven thousand. So uh the the pirates manager, Mr. Haney, uh, you know, oh, oh, is that was that Mr. Oh, I'm sorry, Fred Haney. I was thinking Mr. Haney, sorry. Uh <laughs> Fred Haney said the he would get that he said you'll get to prove yourself. And Frank Thomas in 53 hit 30 home runs, 102 RBIs, and the Pirates were not good in the 50s. They were not a good team. And um he became a regular after a Hall of Famer Ralph Kiner got set, traded to the Cubs. And here's the interesting part. So the, the they played at Ford's Field in Pittsburgh, if uh, memory serves me correct. So something that interesting that they had in right field was they had something called Kiner's Corner. Are you aware of this, Michael Mondragon? I am. I am. It was previously known as Greenberg Garden. So what happened was, they made this area where they literally shortened the outfield fences by 30 feet from 365 to 335. Pretty much, and that's why it's called Congress Corner because he would just bomb home runs over that way. Right. So when Frank Thomas came in, they got rid of that air of Kinder's Corner when Kinder left it. And they just opened it back up to be 365. Thomas figured later that had the shorter wall remained, his home run totals would have doubled and most likely he would have finished his career of more than 500 oh wow how about that how wow. about that because again you said he was with the pirates until what year did he leave the pirates do you have that andy he was uh 51 to 58 yes so think about that yeah and the wall and that wall because I, I just love one of these tangents the pirates pitching staff obviously did not like it either there was a pitcher named murray dixon who was 66 and 85 with the pirates from 49 to 53 once said with some justification, the Greensfield Gardens was largely responsible for my record. <laughs> so you gotta love it. Just the logistics of a baseball stadium, how much of a difference it can make for him. Um, but one thing I love too is that he fought Branch Ricky again, saying, like, I'm a major leaguer now and I want to be paid accordingly. And Frank asked him how much he wanted, and uh, Ricky asked him, he said, I, and, and uh Frank said, I want fifteen thousand. And that did not go over well. Wow. <laughs> and he says, you go along with my offer of 12500 If you have another good year, I'll take good care of you. And against their judgment, Thomas accepted that. And uh, the next year, 54, 298, 23 home runs, 94 RBIs. Great season. He went to Ricky. And and uh, and uh, for a substantial increase, and remember he said it was 12 5 What did Branch Ricky come back with? <laughs> 15, 15 grand. Wow. And then he was kept... And he was then compared negatively to Ralph Kiner. And uh and, and then Thomas said the lines of if you want to compare me, give me the same opportunity. Put back Greens the Greenberg Gardens and I'll hit you 50 home runs because I can tattoo the scoreboard. I love that this guy, and he actually held out the 55 season. He did not play for a while. Oh wow. It's crazy. You just think about this. Like, I'm like, I love just reading stuff like this. And um yeah, he actually held out. Ricky warned him, go ahead and hold out. I'll keep you out of baseball for five years. That's what Branch Ricky said. <laughs> One thing I loved, I didn't know. Apparently, a nickname for Branch Ricky was El Cheapo. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I love it. I just love this. It's, 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 I need Cowboy Jack. Cowboy Jack would be all over this. And uh, Thomas succeeded getting the team's offer up to $18,000, and then he signed. You know? wow. And it's funny because then that year was his only real bad year, and he still hit 25 home runs with bad like 245. But again, he had, he had a, a good, a very good, solid career, you know. And uh, his best year is 58 with 35 home runs and 109 RBIs, you know. Just And he said he ended up going to the Mets. Now, do you have the notes for me that he – was he in the expansion draft, right? Is that why he was the first Met? Yeah. And um, so oh, what does it say here? After being acquired by the expansion New York Mets, he led the team with 34 home runs and 94 RBIs in their first season in 62 – his hitting declined after that year, and he ended up playing uh, for five clubs in his last uh, three seasons. But I, I'm, you told me this that he actually played in 
the recent old timers uh, game. He, he actually well, I don't know if he played, but he appeared there. He appeared, so, yeah. yeah. I'm he sorry. He appeared at the old timers game in 2022 for the Mets. If you if you go see the list, it was I feel like it was almost every person who ever played on the Mets. So it was like a hundred names on that list. And he was on that list. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I I thought that when I saw this again. I'm like, oh my gosh, he was still there and he was he been he passed away at 90 you know, 93, how old he was. Yeah. It's crazy. He, he actually uh, suffered a fall in tw- uh, fall of 2021. Um, wow. And despite the fall, he was uh, well enough to attend that. He was, he attended the game. He did not. Oh, good. Play. He was there. Oh, that's good. That That's yeah. very good to hear. Yeah. You know? uh, and I, and as much as, um, you know, I, I, I actually hate the segment because we're talking about uh, someone who's passed away. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but it's I, I love celebrating uh, their accomplishment and just talking about them in general. There was another uh, person here. And uh, if Cowboy Jack was here, I would ask him uh, where he played uh, college baseball, Arizona State. Um, he, he actually played for Arizona State. Let me let me look at the notes here. Um he yeah. played, uh, he attended Arizona State, where uh, this is Sal Bando, uh, yes. played baseball uh, under Bobby Winkles, who is a, a Hall of Fame a college coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a member of the 1965 College World Series champion and was named College World Series Most Outstanding Player. Right. And uh, eventually uh, went to the Oakland A's, uh, where he's probably best known for his baseball career. Now, let me add one thing, too. Since Arizona State, he actually is in the College Baseball Hall of Fame as well. That's right. That's right. We've been talking about a lot about that at, at yeah, the College really Baseball happened, Hall of yeah. Fame. So he's uh, uh, his Major League Baseball st- statistics, uh, 254 lifetime batting average, 242 home runs, 1,039 RBIs, play for the Kansas City and o- Oakland Athletics from 66 to 76 Milwaukee Brewers um, from 77 to 81. That's actually where I know him because I remember when I first started getting into baseball card collecting, yep. um, Sal Bando was uh, on the, the 79 or 78, you know, um, uh, baseball cards. He was a four-time all-star average 23 home runs and 90 uh, runs batted in, uh, in his last eight years in Oakland. Um, mm-hmm. Often overshadowed uh, by his uh, contemporary, who was Brooks Robinson. Oh, yeah, I played third base. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. I, like do you have? I, I know he made the All Star team a few times. He actually started once over Brooks, and that's that's like because if you ever seen Brooks Robinson, his nickname was a human vacuum cleaner for a reason. You yes. Know? Yes, he was a uh, four time All Star, 69, 72, 73, and seventy four, and that's right at the peak of the A's and. Uh, and if you see there, it says Captain Sal. He actually was named the captain of the athletics. I don't remember the exact year, but he only had been 25 years old when they named him the captain of that team. Because at that time, you had uh, Reggie Reggie Jackson was just coming up. You had, I think, a very young Catfish Hunter. Yeah. Gene uh, Tennis. Gene Tennis was catching. You had, I think, Burke Campanaris, I think, was on the team then. Um, I definitely want, I want to mention a couple of things I found out. I, I love just doing the research on this stuff. So, you know, they decided to make him captain, and the A's were a slow up and coming young team. And they actually won the AL West from every year from 71 to 75. And also, I forgot Vita Blue, Joe yeah. Rudy. Oh, friend of the show, Raleigh Fingers. We had yes. two friends of the shows who were on the A's in the spirit, Reggie and yes. Raleigh. That's so there right. You, go, you know, and, um, and he, he reached his peak right as this team reached their peak. And I, I do want, I hope I can find the thing I love. So in, um, 72, they they made the World Series because they didn't make the World Series in 81. In 71, they lost to the Orioles, I believe. In 72, they beat the Tigers to get to the World Series. And they were playing the Reds. So this is what I love. This, again, where you get to just, you know, if if people are super nerdy into baseball, just just look up Saber, S-A-B-R dot org. Like their their research is fantastic. So these teams are considered pulling off. So Cincinnati Reds, this is I guess maybe that's not even really the, I guess it's kind of the start of the big red machine. You know, they've been, they've been the younger Johnny bench, Pete Rose, mm-hmm. five, six years into his career. So this series was called the hairs versus the squares. <laughs> so, you know, the A's were called the swinging A's and they shunned baseball for by proudly sporting mustaches and beards. And Sal Bando said, we got a $300 bonus for going to mustache. So I, I love like that, and I love that yep. they actually beat the Reds and won the World Series that year because you know 
the the Reds were so clean cut and all that stuff. And I thought it was kind of funny. But he also, at the same time, was very outspoken in talking about uh, owner Charles Finley, you know, Mm -hmm. about getting in players' matters and lives, you know. And there was no TV contract to air A's games in the Bay Area. And again, it's like, it's your fan apathy. The A's won three World Series in a row. And it's still like, you know, it's just like crickets probably. You know what I mean? Right, right. You know, yeah, it's it's really a shame because they were they're a fantastic team. So, and, and this is kind of crazy. Like I, um, at the end of his career, Bando ranked third in AL history with 1,896 career games at third base. Wow. Also ranked fourth in league history in assists, tied for fourth in double plays, and 10th in putouts. Um, his 235 home runs as a third baseman ranked third in AL history, 789 RBIs as an Oakland uh, player w- was a record until Mark McGuire passed him in 1996. His 192 home runs with the team was a home uh, uh, was a record uh, for right-handed hitters in Oakland until Jose Canseco passed him in 91. Um, he became, show, excuse me, friend of the show, Jose Canseco. That's right. That's right. Uh, and, and then he was also, uh, then he went to the Brewers and, and, uh, and after his uh, career, he was a special assistant to the Brewers before serving, serving as a team's general manager from October 91 to August 99, which I, I wow. forgot about as well. Is that, wow. Eight, that long be a GM. Wow. And not the Brewers are that great, but you are, you're a GM for eight years. You're obviously doing an all right job. Yeah. Super respected in uh, baseball. And, and he's, again, he's been around baseball. Like it, I've known his name ever since I knew baseball yeah. and uh, his name has been around. So salute uh, to, uh, Two fallen heroes of baseball. Um, tip of the cap. Tip of the cap. Rest in power. All right. So that is the Baseball Brew Crew podcast for this week. Angelo, I know you have a plug for your Rip and Review coming up this weekend. Hey, thank you guys for faithfully tuning in each and every Saturday uh, for Rip and Review. Um, go back in the archives, check out some of the old videos. Last week, I opened up the Zoo Packs Mystery Packs. Um, and it, did it turn out to be a Zoo Pack or did it turn out to be a Poo Pack? <laughs> uh, you'll have to go back to the archives and find out. Uh, this upcoming Saturday, premiering at 6 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, I'll be opening up a blaster box of 2022 Top Stadium Club Baseball. So excited to share that with you guys. And uh, if you guys are in the Las Vegas area, February 4th and 5th, Saturday and Sunday, Pro Bowl games weekend in Las Vegas. I will be in attendance at the Front Row Card Show at the Tuscany Casino. Frontrowcardshow.com for all the information there. Just $5 tickets in advance, uh, both um, Saturday and Sunday. Um, They'll be there. Uh, Lots of vendors set up. I'll be filming some content for the channel. Um, So if you you are in the Las Vegas area, please um, stop by and check it out. And if you see me, uh, come find me and say hello. And uh, I have a couple of these baseball brew crew mystery grab bags to gift um, to those that come and find me. So there's a auto or a relic in each one of those packs. I'll have four of them. So uh, come find me and, uh, and come check it out. So front row card show.com for all the information. Um, But yeah, tune into rip and review this Saturday and stay tuned for um, some content that I'll be filming at the front row card show. Fantastic. Yeah, and here's where you can find us on all the socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch, and TikTok. Uh, Kevin, I know that you and I are going to uh, be coming up and having some fun uh, in Palm Springs oh, pretty right. soon. So, uh, And then we also have uh, our interviews that we just did recently with Japan Ball, uh, Baseball Bucket List, uh, Scott Emerson from the Oakland A's, the pitching coach. Uh, so yeah, check the archives. Uh, we have a lot of great stuff, more c- stuff coming as well. Kevin, did you have any last words before we sign off for this week? No, I just got to say thank you, Brew Crew Universe. And want to send a shout out to Cowboy Jack. We miss you. We'll hope you have a back with us next week and you survive Utah. Definitely. So that is it. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. <laughs>